Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our webinar series. So today we are going to crack straight on with uh, the webinar around PD. So you have found PD, what next? So I'm, my name is Neil Davis, and Ed Monaghan. Right on it. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, if you have any questions at any time through the webinar, then please uh, shoot through. There, there should be a questions box in that. Uh, Brad will be monitoring the questions whilst I'm speaking, and when Brad is speaking, I'll look through the questions. We'll try and answer them either during the presentation, or um, we will also have a session at the end where we can we can shoot through any further questions. Okay, let's move that on. Okay, just a quick one because we've got a lot of new attendees during in this presentation. A very very brief history of EA Technology as an introduction. So EA Technology uh, was founded in 1966 or 50 or so years ago and as the UK Electricity Research Centre. And today we uh, have offices around the world and um, are, are very much involved in, in electrical network um, uh, asset management and uh, the future energy transition. So. Uh, as an organization, we've definitely evolved from uh, the original time. If you look there, one of the very first electric uh, vehicle sort of trials that were, were going on way back in uh, the early days, and we're involved in that today as well. Globally, we're, we're no longer 100% in, in the UK, so we have offices uh, from the United States um, the, uh, all the way through to Australia, Brisbane, which is where Brad and I are situated and know a lot of people will be dealing with the uh, Singapore office that are on the on the webinar today. We have customers around the world. The um, electricity companies are major focus, uh, are a major uh, set of customers as well as anyone with a high voltage um, or significant electrical assets and networks. We, we provide um, a numerous sort of things sort of um, combined into these these four main areas are uh, looking at LV interventions. LV is, is very much um, in focus nowadays as, as the, the network uh, uh, transformation is taking place. Uh, and we, we've, we've always had a strong consultancy element about how running the networks, software modeling and platforms in order to deliver value. Uh, today, we're really going to be concentrating on one area of the, the HV monitoring side of uh, the business. In the HV monitoring, we'll do things from uh, supply and use of handheld equipment. And we'll talk a lot about that today in the, uh, in, in the partial discharge elements, uh, all the way to permanent monitoring, other condition assessment, dial diagnostics, substation surveys, overhead lines, etc. And, and of course, it's always important for everyone to remember, once you get a failure, it's an opportunity to learn. So if you can uh, carry out failure investigation, you can see uh, what, what sort of condition information you could have uh, seen in advance to try and prevent that. So it's closing the loop and we do a lot of work in that area as well. So moving straight on to the, the main content of the presentation today, um, we're gonna be talking about uh, condition monitoring and partial discharge in particular. And, and when you found signals, what do you do next? So the, we'll, we'll mainly concentrate on the handheld PD detection, but all the, the techniques and the theory that we're doing is, is still applicable and still uh, useful for the monitoring elements of it. And throughout the, the presentation and very much at the end, we'll, we'll show you a case study. Uh, and hopefully with this, what you'll be able to do is, is, is see the sort of things that you could trip up and what we do to, to make sure that we get the best diagnosis we can online before we absolutely take anything out of service and implement and take any any action to remove the, the risk for failure off the network. That's what we're really trying to um, get across in this presentation today. So without further ado, condition monitoring and partial discharge, why actually do we do that? And, and ultimately, all of this work is always revolving around the three main things. Number one, priority for all companies should be um, to increase safety. So if we can stop things blowing up unexpectedly, <coughs> stop that disruptive failure, we're going to increase our safety. And as things are not 
failing um, when we're not expecting them, then we're going to get improved asset performance anyway. So we're going to drive the performance of the network up and remove failures um, at the same time. If we do that and we can be proactive in getting uh, potential faults off the network before they fail, then we're also going to get a financial benefit. So these three elements, three drivers, really go hand in hand. If we can prevent the failures, you can see that we've got the, um, the pitch filled cable box in the right hand side here, which is disruptively failed. That, if anyone is in the substation, is a significant safety um, a safety incident. We, we get that out. We've got an outage that we didn't get, so we get improved performance. And we're going to have to react to that. And if we can do that in a proactive, planned manner, then that is going to be cheaper. So it's all about these three elements. And what we always have to remember is that disruptive failure of switch gear, in particular substation failures, is eight, around eight, uh, 85% of all these failures are either going to be caused by partial discharge or PD will be there before the failure occurs. So if we're going to do one condition monitoring um, technique for uh, switch gear, and for, for cables and partial discharges is going to give us the best value for our expenditure on that. Very briefly about the, the, the PD classifications, this is, this is an, an important thing to consider and Brad will talk quite a bit about this, about when we're on site and, and how we treat these things differently. There are the three main classifications of PD. Uh, Discharge that is happening inside solid insulation in the top left. So we may have a void in one of those pitch filled cable boxes or in a cast resin component, a transformer CT, for example, or, or in the solid insulation of a cable termination. So something that's happening enclosed in insulation and that breaks down a part of that insulation until eventually the dielectric cannot withstand from the high voltage to earth and we get the flash over the failure. That's the hidden defect that you're never going to see with maintenance, you're never going to see with inspections, uh, you're never going to smell it, you're never going to hear it, but that's the thing that can give you the much uh, unexpected failures there. The second type of discharge is probably more common on, well, is much more common on the air insulated switch gear. And maybe the things that is uh, definitely more visual and you see more of nowadays, and that's the surface discharge, surface tracking. So this is the sort of thing where you're getting breakdown of the insulation across the surface of insulation. So such as maybe a cable termination phase, phase discharge, or you've got a, a cast resin type um, insulation and you're starting to see treeing and tracking across that surface. Uh, it can start from different things, pollution, sharp points in there, different uh, and basically poor stress control. Once that starts, that accelerates away. So that's a big uh, type of our discharge. The third main type is corona discharge. So you hear about corona quite often. Um, you've got the corona cameras out there. You've now got these ultrasonics, which you're trying to show that. Generally, the um, corona is, is, is most often um, non-destructive. So it's corona discharge by, by its nature is from a sharp point into a gas. So typically you're gonna find that in outdoor uh, switch yards. So you've got arcing horns or you've just got sharp connectors in there. When you get that um, stress built up across that um, sharp point, it discharges into, into the air around it and causes that corona discharge. If it's just a sharp point into air, there's not much um, insulation that's gonna be um, broken down. There's no, there's no real detriment to the to the uh, to any any um, primary insulation, so it's not something that we're often concerned about. There are instances, but generally, corona discharge is um, a pretty benign. And the fourth state that we say here, it's not the primary state; it's somewhere in between an internal um, discharge and a surface discharge. Is like discharge across a gap. This is something that we come across quite regularly. Uh, Brad will show a couple of examples on this. And this is if we close up the insulation in both sides of this, it becomes an internal discharge. 
Um, but what we end up having really with this type of discharge is we have some elements that are very similar to internal discharge and some elements that are uh, very similar to surface discharge. So it discharges across a gap, quite high, high levels. And again, uh, Brad will talk about that, about the sort of amplitudes that we see. So these are the sort of discharges that we need to identify. And when we are taking measurements and we're trying to figure out what we need to do, how quickly, quickly we need to do something and what the defect may be, we absolutely keep these in mind and the type of patterns that they are generated uh, from the different sensors, which again, we'll talk about. So the different sensors that we do use for, um, for discharge. First of all, the, the transient earth voltage. This, this is something that uh, EA Technologies and Organization, when we were the uh, research council back in the 1970s and 1980s, we sort of come across the, the phenomenon of the transient earth voltage. And this is a, a fast rising pulse, generally in the VHF electromagnetic spectrum. We usually measure that around two to 80 megahertz. And this is really um, the, the primary technique for detecting internal void type discharges. This was a sort of technique that was developed back in the days where we had the um, uh, bitumen filled cable boxes and things like that. So the primary cause of disruptive failure was these uh, internal void type discharges. So TEV is the technique that we use for that. It will also detect high level surface discharge to earth. So if you've got a high component to earth, then the TEV technique um, comes into its own for that as well. However, when in the 1980s and 1990s, we started taking out the um, pitch filled compound filled cable boxes and we started introducing uh, three core uh, dry terminations into the population what we found is a, a is a significant increase in um, in cable termination failures caused by uh, incorrect stress stress control and an installation so you'd see a lot of three core cables with cross phases and things like that now, when that happens, you get a much lower element of component to earth. So, but what you will get is you will get breakdown of, um, of the, the insulation, so surface tracking that generates ultrasonic activity. So you get high levels of sound, ultrasonic sound generated where the tracking is occurring between the phases. So airborne ultrasonic um, detection of PD really started to be applied around the, um, uh, the the sort of mid 1990s is where it was particularly understood and started to be um, really used in anger. So that's where the technology then ended up developing the ultra TEP range of, uh, of test equipment because that's where we needed the both techniques. And if we can combine them, obviously it makes it more convenient for the users. Now, since that time, uh, we, we also started to use additional sensors. So the, the TEV and the ultrasonic are the primary sensors that we use for everyday uh, surveying of, of switchgear in particular. We also now use and deploy two more uh, types of sensors, the high frequency current transformers, which um, they are very, very good for detection of the high frequency pulses produced in cables. And if we can place them around the earth strap of the, uh, of a cable termination, we can look right down the cable. And we've got case studies to show that. We can always also use that for uh, a more localization um, and, and as an additional uh, sensor into, into trying to figure out what exactly is happening. And the fourth one now is used is, is a directional antenna on working in the UHF range. So as we move from the VHF range up into the ultra high frequency, the, um, the strength of the signal uh, drops and how much it propagate um, will drop. So whereas transient earth voltages will travel quite widely, uh, UHF will attenuate much more quickly. This is, is used um, to our benefit when we're looking for um, trying to localize things in, particularly in open air assets or substations. UHF is also very good in the substation, uh, the switchyard environment, because we don't have to place a capacitive sensor on the metalwork to detect 
um, to detect the, uh, the the PD. So we use UHF for open air acids. Also, when we're working in the UHF, it ignores corona because a corona discharge disappears around the 200 to 250 um, megahertz range. We use that in switch yards and where TEV cannot be used to touch. So we use the ultra high frequency um, for those primary um, uh, reasons, if we like so. Okay. Closing on it. So we, all right. So I'm going to hand off. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Brad to, to talk about some of our field experience and what we do in the field to find the PD problems. Okay, so we will be talking about the interested plus two. I've got one here next to me. Okay, so diagnosis. When we're out in the field and when we're testing for PD activity, the, the three main questions and our thought process needs to be, is it real? Are the signals that I'm detecting from a real PD source, or is it just coming from some sort of background noise that I'm not concerned about at all? So that needs to be diagnosed and answered. Where is it located is the next one. As Neil was talking about, signals will travel from, from, from sometimes great distances away. Sometimes they'll be really close to where you are, but you need to be able to have the skills and the thought process to figure out whether it's located uh, right in front of you, somewhere away, and how to prove that. Uh, and then what is the defect? So when we diagnose problems, we will have a very good frame of, um, well, we'll have a, a fair amount of data that we've collected from the Ultratip Plus 2 from our surveying that will lead us towards the correct diagnosis of the source and what the defect very likely is. Okay, so we'll start off with the easiest one to diagnose. It's called ultrasonic testing. So when we do ultrasonic testing, what we do is we have our handheld instrument, which um, we've got a picture here of Thomas, one of our engineers. He's holding an UltraTed Plus 2, the exact same as this one. It may even be this one, I'm not sure. But uh, he's got his headset on, as you can see around his ears, and then he has an ultrasonic microphone. And what Thomas is doing is he's listening with this microphone into this ring main unit, which would be running it. This is a 33 kV ring main unit. Uh, he's listening into all the high voltage chambers to see if he can hear the sound given off by sparks. So if, if you can imagine inside this chamber, there's a high voltage uh, cable coming in and connecting onto a set of bushings. If there's some sort of defect in there uh, where the, the clearances are compromised, it wasn't put together properly, there's a poor HV connection, any of those types of things. You could have PD activity and you could have sparking and arcing going on inside that chamber. So what we do when we ultrasonically test is we listen with the microphone into all the chambers to see if we can hear any sound. It's a, a fairly simple test when you get out there and start doing it in the field because it's a microphone listening to sound and it's coming in through your headset. So there are a number of different ultrasonic sensors. Um, the first one that we use primarily for indoor switchboards is this airborne microphone here. We also have what we call a contact probe. Could you pass me the contact probe, please? So we also have a contact probe. So this here is a magnetic probe that is uh, placed onto the outside of the metalwork. And what it will do is it will listen for the exact same activity. It will listen for arcing and sparking going on inside the chamber. Now, when that comes into its own is where you have no air paths at all through to the chamber that your airborne microphone won't work. If there's no air paths, the sound can't get out to your microphone, so then we use this one to have a listen. Now, the easiest way to think about this is uh, as a doctor would use to listen to your heart, such as a stethoscope, listening to the inside of the chamber from the outside. Okay. Now the instrument itself will help you. The instrument itself has some smarts in it. It has an algorithm that runs in the background and it listens to the sound that's coming in through the microphones and it will classify that sound as noise or it will classify that sound as partial discharge. So it will help the user and also analysis back in the office once the data has been recorded. It will help everyone involved to diagnose whether the sound that's being listened to is created by noise or created by partial discharge, which is a very handy thing to have um, in terms of how 
helpful the instrument can be because you've got a second opinion based on the sound. Now, earlier when I was talking about whether the sound that you are hearing is actually PD or actually noise needs to be diagnosed in the field. Okay, so or ideally it's diagnosed in the field. You come, can come back another time once it's been analysed, but you should be able to do it in the field. So here we've got a case study where this is a VT up on top of the switchboard. And we, when we listen to the sound from that via our flexible microphone, we could see this phase resolved partial discharge pattern. And this pattern here looks to me as if it's single phase partial discharge surface PD. Our algorithm, I don't know if you guys can zoom in on that, but it says 81% certainty that it's caused by PD. And that's the algorithm running in the background, giving a classification as to whether the sound is that. And if we were able to play that sound, it would sound like crackling and arcing and sparking. And that's the sound that comes in through your headphones. Now, on this exact same board, there was an identical VT about uh, five or six panels down. We listened to that VT and all we could hear from that was a magnetic hum of the VT itself. So there was no PD at that VT. The phase plot for that looked like this, where we have these very tight clusters of sound coming through. Um, it does look phase resolved in that you've got clusters of data 180 degrees apart, but this type of phase resolved partial discharge pattern is consistent with the magnetic hum of the VT itself. The algorithm here classified the sound that's coming in through the microphone as 100% certainty that it's noise, and we agree with that. And the sound of that magnetic hum just sounds completely different to what PD sounds like. PD will be a, a harsh, crackling, sort of frying of bacon type sound. And the magnetic hum is, uh, if you're familiar with the way that transformers sound out in switchyards or inside distribution substations where the, the transformers just go, hmm, basically like that. <laughs> okay, now phase resolve PRPD or phase resolve partial discharge patterns. We learn a lot from these patterns and we can tell a lot from these patterns. So when Neil earlier was talking about corona type discharge, if we do an ultrasonic test and we find a corona source, pretty much all the time you will only have one hump of data along your sine wave as opposed to do two humps of data, which is here. Um, I should probably explain what a phase result partial discharge pattern is. Basically, along this screen here, from here to here, is the time of one sine wave worth of activity. So on a 50 hertz network, that's 20 milliseconds. Um, on the left hand, on the vertical axis, we have the amplitude of the, uh, whatever you're measuring. So here, the amplitude of the activity is going up to a peak here. And over time, we can see where events of activity are occurring with reference to our 360 degree sine wave. Now, when we have single phase surface PD, it looks like this, where you have two humps of data. And that's because as your electrical stress comes up, as your volts rise over time, you will have PD occur, and then you, your volts drop and go through the zero crossing, not much happens. And then the same on the negative half sine wave, where the, the volts increase, the stress um, increases, and you get PD again, and it happens over and over and over and over, maybe a 50 hertz sine wave to create that electrical stress and crackling and arcing and the, um, and then hence you get a, a phase resolved partial discharge pattern. Now, when we have a gap type discharge, uh, that's the one Neil was talking about earlier where there's a, an intermediate stage between internal void PD and surface PD. And it's basically where sparks are jumping a gap because it's either a poor connection or it's uh, two pieces of metal that are running at dissimilar voltages, usually through because of induction and a lack of um, bonding and earthing. Now, here's an example of what that gap discharge uh, looks like in, in terms of the phase resolved partial discharge pattern from ultrasonic. And then we can also tell if we've got single phase, two phase or three phase type PD. This one here is an example of two phases worth of PD occurring at the uh, within the same measurement. You can see here how the upper part of the amplitude is active for longer when compared to this one. This one here looks like surface PD single phase. This one looks like surface PD two phase where it's, there's, a, there's a second phase getting involved there. 
So we can tell a lot from the patterns. You do get used to looking at them and you do get used to diagnosing them. And we have databases of them where we can help out. Now, this is a, a, a small case study where this was one of my ones where I scanned an 11 kV switchboard with an ultrasonic sensor. I scanned the actual VT panel and I heard this sound, which is a, a, a harsh crackling sound. And I also saw the phase result of partial discharge pattern that looks like this. Now this here to me looks like two phases of PD occurring because it's more active, for, it's active for longer than it would be for one phase of PD. If it was one, I'd expect it to look like that. Okay. So the, we advised the client that he needed to um, shut down and inspect that chamber for PD activity, see what he could see, see if he could conduct any repairs, just figure out what the problem is. So he, uh, the engineer shut down the chamber, opened up the panels and inside he could see this VT here and the VT leads that run up into the switch gear are these black cables that you can see which I'm running my laser over. Now the left hand side lead was resting against this uh, earthed metal bracket and the right hand side lead was resting against the side of the chamber. You can see this white pattern of activity uh, or this white um, deposit of, of uh, Call it chemicals on the side of the, the metalwork there. That's very indicative of PD activity. But the, the root cause of this uh, PD activity is because these black leads are too long. So the fix for it was to get some new leads, make sure they're nice and short, and make sure you've got good clearances between the black leads themselves and the, uh, the, the earth's metalwork of that switchboard. Now, even though that lead is insulated, you've still got electrical stress on the outside of the insulation. And if that is near or touching something of another voltage, you can get, a lot of the times do get PD from PD occurring. One of the big causes of PD. Uh, now, trending ultrasonic activity in terms of its amplitude does not always work the way you think it would work. It doesn't keep going up and up and up and up and up in amplitude until the point where it, you cause a high voltage explosion and, the, and the, uh, the asset fails. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes we have seen where amplitude has gone up and up and up and it's getting worse and worse and worse. But here is a, an example of where we monitored a, an asset, it was a circuit breaker I believe, yeah. over the space of about three months where ultrasonic activity down here in this portion, back on the 15th of, the, of March, there was no PD activity occurring. And around about here on the 29th of March, PD activity started to occur. From there, it raised in amplitude up to about a maximum of about 40 decibels of sound. And from there, it continued on its way for the space of about, I don't know, two and a half months until it eventually blew up and failed. But you can see from this activity here, there was no rise, linear rise or exponential rise, or even rise over that amount of time. Um, to when it actually failed. So that, that there is a very important uh, key point when you're trying to diagnose ultrasonic sources. Best thing you can do is shut it down, get in there and have a good look at what is causing the PD. And then from there, figure out a course of action. Oh, sorry, we skipped a slide there. Now, interpreting ultrasonic measurements. So the, ab the absolute number of the trending is not always the primary consideration. It's all about where the defect is, as, as in this right-hand side example here, where the defect is in terms of how, how much length you have for insulation. More important is the sound characteristic and determining that whether PD is occurring. Take an outage, visually examine it, and the PRPD and the algorithm will help you. I just one point to note on, on the ultrasonic as well, is that the ultrasonic, when we're diagnosing where is it coming from, the if the, the ultrasonic is very directional, so if it's coming from that panel, the problem is in that panel. If you can hear it with an airborne microphone, if you open it up, you should be able to see the problem. So actually determining where the problem is, is actually a relatively straightforward thing to do. Yeah. It's the easiest one to diagnose. If you yeah. hear a sound, you shut it down, open it up, and you can see the problem. It'll be local to where you found the, uh, found the sound. Okay, TEV measurements at results. So the next one. So, hang on, I think I skipped one there. So TEV technique. So here again, we have Thomas, he's doing a TEV test on a switchboard, on a ring main unit. 
The correct way to do a TEV test is to hold the instrument up against the outside of the panels and detect the TEV signals that are basically flowing along the outside of the panel in terms, they are tiny little voltage rises that occur on the earth plane and they're being created by some sort of defect. Okay, where do we take uh, TEV readings? We take TEV readings basically all over the switchboard. If I was scanning this ring main unit here, I would take a TEV reading on the front of the cable box, on the circuit breaker, up on top of the bus, at the rear of this bus. I would also, if I was able to physically do it, I would get underneath the switchboard and I would run a TEV test on the outside of the HV cables under there. That's often the best spot to test because you are at the electrically closest point to the switch gear because your, your TEV sensor, which is located here, is only you know, a few millimetres or a centimetre away from the, um, the earth screens and the HV conductor itself. Uh, in the past, with the previous instruments of this, the Ultra TEV Plus One and with the, with the old monitors, what we were only able to do was look at the amplitude of TEV activity and the pulse per cycle count, or how many times per sine wave the PD activity was occurring. And we had to make a judgment call on that based on experience and how the TEV signals were behaving. So if it was very low in amplitude, um, it would be classed as low, you know, medium is medium, high is high. But the pulse per cycle count will give you a good indication whether you've got noise, internal void, surface tracking, uh, sparking across a gap, floating metalwork type issues. Now with the UltraTev Plus 2, what you're able to do is that, that same graph and that same interpretation mode runs in the background. And it also, you can see it on the screen that it's always running and it will tell you what, the, what uh, it thinks. So that's another piece of the puzzle as to determining what's going on. We also have the phase plots that help currently which we have a look at now. So when we're looking at TEV, we can see the phase plot as well. On the left, on the top left-hand side here, we have internal void single phase. If you ever run a TEV test and you see this pattern that's on the screen here, you are very much, you've, you've pretty much found PD and you need to further investigate that, locate that and do something about that. Tell someone that you found that because that there is a stereotypical PD pulse. Here is where we found PD inside the uh, the oil fill chamber of the transformer. Uh, we did that by TEV testing the cable that goes into the transformer. So we're able to find a defect on the inside of the transformer by simply holding this on the cable on the outside of the transformer. When we have contact or floating metalwork type signals, we tend to see this pattern where you have big rectangular clouds um, because that, that's because they're always the same amplitude, always the same energy, and there's sparks jumping in set gap. So it, it gives you that type of pattern. And then you can always have noise. We'll always see noise. And here is an example of phase lock noise. Sometimes you hear noise. Sometimes you hear noise. But you can always hear, you, you can get it if you put it on your phone. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes see noise. You don't always get noise. Ideally, there would be no noise and you'd just find uh, nothing or PD. That'd be great. Okay, so here is a typical example of a, this is an old Ray Roll LMT type CT that has failed in the field. These uh, can have internal void type defects in them due to basically air voids in the cast resin construction of the, uh, the insulation of the asset. And typically we see here, this is a single phase internal void VT, uh, phase result partial discharge pattern that's consistent with that type of CT. Now, TEV signals, they travel, they tr can travel a long way along cables, they can be imported through the air. So you can't go up and do one TEV test on one asset and say, diagnosed PD. You might have detected the signals from PD, but you need to test further and do extra things to figure out where the PD is coming from. So um, as you can see on the right hand side here, this is a, an overview summary of a switchboard that's been tested of eight panels. And we can see on the right hand side panel, on panel number eight, we've got high level TEV signals, which are in the red, you know, they're classed as red. Orange ones are, are on panel seven, but at the front we have red, and then we're all green down here. So most likely the PD is situated in or something near panel eight, but we've also got a few reds along the front here. Now, all of these signals here may be coming from the one source 
Well, you could have two sources. You could have a source on this switchboard and you could have a source nearby. And all of that can be diagnosed by analyzing your phase resolved partial discharge patterns. Um, it can also be diagnosed by using the ultraturf locator, which there's a slide coming up on that in a second. Um, and now analyzing the, the data in the field is very important to be able to come up with the best answers to figure out the next steps. So when I spoke about the locator, this is the locator. So you can see here we have what looks like a red UltraTurf Plus 2, but this is an attachment that plugs into the UltraTurf Plus 2. And what it does is it uses the TEV time of flight technique. So in your hands, you will have two TEV sensors and you can place them on the back switchboard or you can place them onto cables and figure out if the PD signals are coming from up the cable or down the cable or from that way along the switchboard or that way along the switchboard because the TEV signals will flow through the cable, hit this sensor first and then the red sensor second and vice versa. So here we have a case study where there's a, this is a switchboard down here on the, the bottom right hand side of your screen here. We were engaged to come out and survey that switchboard and then monitor it. When we surveyed the switchboard, there were no PD signals detected at all. Uh, we installed the monitor and then over time, um, PD signals appeared. We went out back out to site and we'd found that they'd closed up this CB. When we first scanned the switchboard, this CB was open and now it's closed. Whenever they closed the CB, we got big level, uh, medium level TEV signals at that switchboard. So from there, we haven't diagnosed PD here, we can just see PD here. So what we need to do is hunt it down like a detective and figure out where it's coming from. So we went to the far end of this cable and tested the switchboard here. Um, we found that the signals were higher at that switchboard. Also the locator was pointing towards that switchboard in terms of the TEV signals. From there, we still hadn't found the PD, we had to continue further. So we went to the other end of this 20 meter cable where we went out to transformer number 47 and here was our highest level signals. So the locator pointed towards that transformer all the way through the circuit and our highest TEV signals were here as well. And what we found was that the transformer cable box there had blown up in the past. They'd conducted repairs to that same transformer cable box, but that either introduced another defect or the original defect was still there. Um, and so if you didn't have this frame of mind where TEV signals travel and you need to track it down, you might think we've got PD in this circuit breaker here, we've got PD in this circuit breaker here, and we've got PD at this transformer, which is basically the wrong answer. You've got one source of PD and it is traveling. Okay, I'll hand over to Neil. We'll go through a couple of case studies. Questions coming in now and again. Oh, we've got case uh, No, I've, I've answered those. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's let's think about these this in practice, and we're going to we're going to do that by looking at a case study where we've used multiple test methods, uh, and we've gone that extra uh, extra step to make sure that we don't that we're doing the right work and we're not replacing good assets just by um, one set of results. So in this, we're looking at we were we were surveying um, a small part of the network and we've got some uh, kiosk type substations here uh sorry i've done that one so oh, I already it? Ah, cool. um right. right so we've we've got two kiosk type substations and we've we've gone to the substations and we found uh signals of pd in substation a here and substation b these are just examples of the the same type of substation that we see in australia so we found signals on the or around the cable terminations one of the classic things one of the biggest cause of failures uh, of switch gear and in you know, on, on a whole hv assets is the termination failing this is where the the people are getting involved this is where the, the stress control is very important it's it's important how uh, the terminations are made how they're fixed on particularly with these these separable connectors We've had issues where the, the alignment of the connectors is slightly wrong, causing discharge. So one of the classics is we found PD. It looks like it's internal void because um, of the, the TEV signals that Brad is saying. The solid insulation is here. We're on the termination. Let's replace the termination. And maybe seven or eight times, times out of 10, that is actually the right thing to do. But it's always worth 
really looking into it in a big, bit more detail to see is that actually when the, the source of discharge is. Let's step back and look at where sub A, sub A and sub B are connected together by a cable, funnily enough. Um, so <laughs> um, we, if we look at the signals and we look at the TEV signals in substation A, we had 35 decibels and about four pulse per cycle. That is it. And, and the, the two, uh, and the clustering looks like right here. One of the clusters is much longer than the other, but we've still got clustering that's showing around 180 degrees apart from the, the start point. That gives us an indication, 35 dB, nearly four pulse per cycle, um, two clusters where we've got an internal void type discharge happening. So we could quite easily say, right, okay, use the locator and figure out is it red, white or blue phase and, and start thinking about replacing that termination. We go to substation B and we do the same thing and we've got very similar pattern. So substation B is 76 meters away from it. This particular instance, we got 39 decibels, so it's slightly higher for around four pulse per cycle. And this is what you, um, you're seeing on the, on the PRPD. 180 degrees apart again we're seeing the, the start of these clusters one of them a bit longer than the, the second cluster but very consistent so have we got first of all what we're thinking now is it one or two sources is it a 39 decibel source in substation b which is actually traveling 76 meters up and giving us a 35 decibel source in substation a that discrepant that difference 39 to to 35 is the first indication that maybe there's something else going on because you would expect a little bit more attenuation on 76 meters from um, this XLP cable. Although signals will travel a lot further than most people realize, sometimes hundreds of meters. So the next thing that we did is we used the HFCT. So Brad is uh, going HFCT. So that again plugs into the into the plus. We Place that around the the earth screen on the um, on the the cables in the in the kiosk substations, and we take the measurement. Now, what that is doing is giving us again PRPD. This time we have across the zero, so the two halves of the cycle are on um, different polarities. So we have here the long cluster and the short, short cluster again, 180 degrees apart, very consistent with the TEV reading. If we look at the waveform capture, it's, it's like an, a, almost a mini oscilloscope inside that Ultra Plus. We see that we've got a fast rise time and a unipolar pulse that we're kind of, uh, that we're detecting at that uh, on the Earth screen at the kiosk. That gives us an indication. This clustering here with this unipolar pulse gives us an indication that where we potentially have. PD happening on the cable itself. So we go to the next stage in that particular investigation. So the next stage, we, we basically took it up a notch and we used three uh, HFCTs at once into a different, slightly different bit of the cable data collector. And we were able to capture, or we're capturing discharge from the cables. We did that at both ends of the substation. So from this, we're capturing uh, hundreds of of waveform captures and, and readings over a few minutes. And you can see in substation A, we've seen around 6,000 or so picocoulombs of, um, of discharge signals are being detected. Very similar PRPD plot again, we've got the, the long cluster and the short cluster. The good thing, uh, when we start using the, the cable data collector, the CDC, we can now start analyzing the waveforms a bit more uh, conclusively. So if we look at this pulse, uh, this red line here is the original pulse coming to us, uh, capturing on the HFC center and the original pulse traveling to that center. The second um, reflection or the first reflection is the, the pulse from the discharge going to the far end of the cable and then coming back to the center. And then we have a third reflection, which is the original pulse, which has traveled to the HFCT, has gone to the far end of the cable again and come back again. And that gives us the length of the cable. This second one gives us the distance to the discharge. The closer in we see 
it to the first pulse means the further it is away from the where the location we're doing. In this particular case, the uh, the the analysis showed it to be about 74% or 56 meters away from substation A. If we look at the substation B set of results, very similar, 6,000 peak kilometers, which again is consistent with the fact that the, the 34 dB, 39 dB, very, very similar sort of readings there. And in this instance, we've got the same set of data where we've got the original pulse, we've got the, the first reflected pulse and the, the second reflection pulse. And that is now showing us that is giving us 26%, which is 20 meters away from that substation. So these are in absolute agreement that the, the location of the discharge is 20 meters from substation B, 74 from substation A. So instead of having uh, thinking about we've got termination issues in, in the kiosk A and termination issues in kiosk B, what we've actually got is one common issue. You then look at the cable, um, uh, the cable records and see what we've got. And we had here a cut-in joint, which was 20 meters away from that substation B. So this is the source of the, the discharge itself. So that's what we we can do. So rather than then going straight in there and replacing joints, what we've done is uh, replacing terminations for no reason. What we've done is done that extra bit of work without taking anything online, it's uh, offline, it's all online testing and located it to this particular joint here. So the, the company in question here should be able to go in, proactively replace that joint. So if you move the open point, nobody needs to be off supply and you can do that in, in a controlled manner in the normal working conditions, normal working hours, and get that done um, and replaced before the failure occurs. So, um, we've done, uh, the, the, so to, to summarize on, on that, uh, we've already done this, this slide, but anyway, the, when, when we're looking at TEV, when you get TEV readings, the, um, the absolute number uh, in TEV is actually useful. Uh, so it is something that you do consider, unlike ultrasonic. So ultrasonic, like Brad was saying, the, 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 the level does not necessarily continue rising and, and it will go up and down based on the environmental conditions, the atmospheric conditions, the, the level of humidity in the, in the atmosphere. Whereas TEV will tend to in, increase. So if you can see, on the picture here, we've got a relatively small void around the conductor. Uh, we've got two or three voids here. Once those voids combine, they can see in the, the second picture, generally that what you're gonna find there is the, the transient the level of transient earth voltage is going up. The other thing that will happen is the, the length of that cluster will potentially increase as well. So when we're looking at the case study with that, uh, that joint 20 meters from the substation, the fact that, that one of those clusters was very, very wide gives us an indication that we're moving towards end of life and it's going to fail in the not too distant future. So with TEV, the PRPD absolutely helps. Brad's already shown that the highest signals are not always the source of, of the activity. And that's where what we get is, is, is a cumulative um, interference where the signals bounce uh, around together across um, discontinuities and you can start getting localized high, which is not actually the source of the, um, the, the, the discharge itself. So further location can be done using different things such as the locator, switching obviously, sexualizing, things like that. So in summary, when, what should you do? So what, um, what should I do next before I act? And, and there's a few different things. So we've found this chart, we've done as much as we can to locate where the problem is. We now need to go in there. So we need, now need to, for example, go in there and replace that joint in order to prevent failures. Now, what can you do? Obviously we can isolate suspected circuits if possible. So we can move an open point um, to, to a location. We can uh, reconfigure the network so that we, we've gives us time to, to act and we're not going to get an unexpected outage. If it's a surface PD that we're trying to control, 
then what you do find is is it's it's a cumulative um, probability, it's a cumulative degradation on surface discharge. If we re control the environment, reduce the, the humidity, you will actually slow the level of deterioration down. So we've had situations where a customer has found a significant um, surface discharge problem and they've got an outage planned or they've got an outage opportunity in a few months time. So in the interim, they've been putting in um, air conditioning units and controlling the environment to reduce um, humidity and slow that degradation down. In panel heaters, if you've already got that, that's really already happening at that point. Sometimes it can't be done. Sometimes you can slow uh, further degradation. One of the important things we always say is if you've got PD, is keep the system stable. Um, reduce the, the, the number of switching operations because when switching occurs, that's when failures can occur. Uh, when you've got that, that surge and that transient signals coming in where failure, uh, when, when switching op, uh, operates, and that might just be the thing that breaks uh, the, that final little bit of the insulation. Of course, safety is our number one priority. So if we've got a, a defect in there, then we, we can limit access to the substation. We can reduce the time that's spent around that suspect asset. Um, asset. Certainly, nobody who doesn't need to be in there should be in there. So, no walkways through substations on industrial um, sites and things like that. And the other thing that you can do is install PD monitoring. So, you can install the monitor to to monitor what is happening, nerve sap through until an action can be taken. Now, the PD monitor itself is obviously not going to stop. Um, a failure occurring, but you can see if something is starting to run away, if things are changing, and that might mean that the you do need to act a little bit sooner than you wanted to. If things are very stable, then maybe we can we can have that little bit of confidence that things are, are going to uh, continue until we can um, take things out out of service. Unfortunately, you do get the situation such as we showed on the on the the monitored switch gear where. You've got three or four months, and then it fails without any upward trend. So you do have to be aware of the type of discharge, what that might be saying, history of uh, failures and things like that. If we do all of these things, and if we um, if we deploy this sort of equipment properly, then it's been proven time and time again that we will improve the performance of the network. We will get greater reliability and, and safety. Um, not greater relatability and safety, which is what we've written here. Um, we will reduce cost. It is always cheaper to proactively go in that. And the other thing that's, uh, that's also important to, to mention is, is that it enables you to make smarter investment decisions. The knowing which of, the, which of your assets is starting to exhibit uh, issues that may be towards end of life gives you a much better indication of where things need to be taken out than maybe just using age-based replacement, which is uh, proven time and again to be not particularly, uh, uh, not the most cost-effective way of managing large populations of, of assets. That brings us to the end of the formal presentation slides. We've still got uh, time. I know Brad is hammering away at the questions there. Okay. A simple question, will the slides and recordings be made available after the session? Yes. That's easy, yes. Uh, for older cable terminations, pitch field, where we are not able to expose the cable sheet, can we have any alternate better practice? Okay, so old, old, older cable terminations where you've got, say, compound insulated cable boxes uh, and things and you haven't got access to the sheet, uh, that that is obviously problematic. It means that you're not going to be able to uh, to, to place HFCT on it. And certainly on on that end, maybe you can at the other end. Always think about that. The TEV will be will be taking you a long way. So you really have to use the the TEV type sensor to to determine at that point. That really becomes your primary sensor. The other thing that we can do is we can use an alternative UHF sensor to see localization, and you can use the uh, the locator probe to see direction of travel. So they're the things that, that really matter at that time. 
if you're trying to monitor the length down the length of the cable to see joints down that if you haven't got access to that earth then that technique becomes um, just unusable and really at that point if you if you really want to um, you really suspect that you've got cable PD then I would be or the, the way to do it is to actually you have to take that cable out of service and run a VLF or um, oscillating wave type test on there to look down the cable to see if there's discharging coming from that. So you'd really have to go to the on offline techniques at that point. No worries. Um, can I get a link to the recording? So it'll the recording be sent out. Yeah, within 20, around 24 hours, the software automatically will send you the, um, the link to the recording and, and a few other useful links that we got in there as well. And uh, we have uh, previous recordings of webinars and things. So if you want to do that, uh, you can see the website at the bottom here, www, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if you go onto that, uh, recordings of, of this webinar will eventually be posted up there and previous webinars are also on there as well. And a lot of other resources, very much a knowledge-based resource for, for people. Okay, I've got one here. Can sensors be installed inside the chambers if earths are not accessible? Uh, yes, that is possible. Um, that is absolutely eminently possible. If, on, yes, on the if, if you can't see the earth from the outside, so you can't get the HFC on outside, then um, it is possible to, and, and we do this quite regularly now, to install a HFCT in a safe manner inside um, and then bring up the connections through the, um, through the, the, the trunk into the secondary chamber and then that allows you to either do um, a handheld UltraTEP Plus or a cable data collector or to use uh, a monitoring type solution on there as well. So you, you can do that. Um, so it's one outage, get, it, get the sensors in there, do that safely, and that allows you to do all everything in, in the future non-intrusively. So it, it's, it is useful. It's been done more and more, I know. Our colleagues in North America are doing uh, an awful lot of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, okay, so we've got one from Vikram. It says spot check versus continuous monitoring versus offline. Which often gives better, or which one gives better prediction to failure for cable condition monitoring? Oh, another good question. Um, good question. Sorry, it is a good question. So the um, they they all play their part, Vikram. The, the so offline testing is offline testing. Taking the cable out of service, VLF testing is absolutely fantastic in terms of you've got a very clean, um, noiseless uh, opportunity to to test that cable. You can slightly overstress if you want, and things like that. The difficulty, of course, with that is you're really limiting to about two cables per day. We've got lots of work that we've done where we're testing in certain networks around the world, we're testing thousands of cables, and we've got very good correlation between the testing online and testing offline. So what, what, you, what you often find is that you can use the online testing to target, so very quick online testing uh, to target where you want to use your expensive and time consuming um, outage, uh, um, inducing, if you like, uh, offline testing first. So for if you've got access to cable screens, we can probably, um, we're, we're testing 30, 40 sets of cable terminations in a day without much problem, depending on, on whether you've got travel. Uh, if you are testing offline, it's one or two cables a day. Now, when you've got critical cables, so critical cables may mean uh, like we were showing on the on the ultrasonic trending, where you've got that three month period before uh, before it it failed. So the P to F range, so the time when you can see the problem until when the failure occurs, was only four months. So if we were doing say a spot check every um, every year, you've got a one in three or a one in four chance of actually finding that discharge before it fails. Now. Cable discharge tends not to be as quick acting as surface discharge in terms of running running away to failure. But that uh, the, the more you're monitoring, the, the more you're reducing your probability to failure. 
So that means that if you've got very critical cables, people, um, and you want to reduce your risk by reducing your probability to failure, then permanent monitoring is absolutely the way forward on that. So we do see that. So we, we, we as an organization for some of our customers are permanently monitoring um, quite a lot of cables or, or hundreds of sets of cables where they're in a critical for the operation and the, the cost of a failure is such that the reduction in probability of failure and therefore reduction in risk is uh, means that, that installing permanent monitoring is a very cost effective solution. Hopefully that answers that. They're all good. Permanent monitoring is always better than periodic testing if you want to prevent failure. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about GIS and SF6 stuff. Okay. Um, I've got, can I use the handheld PD detector to locate PD at each compartment of a 150 kV GIS? Uh, yes, you can. Right. There's the, so for GIS uh, operating at the, the higher voltage, um, then there, there are UHF sensors that we would, would soon to be putting into here that you can use to, to go compartment to compartment. Um, the, there are ways of doing that. We might take that one offline and, and, and talk further on that because it, it gets more complicated. Um, but yes, it, it's technically possible that you can do that. For just to mention on 33 kV GIS, uh, where you haven't got that higher uh, level of pressure, then the TEP technique is, is a, an absolutely valid technique there. And we do see and, and find problems on that. Using the HFCT on the, um, always using the HFCT onto the, the earth screen of a cable termination going into GIS with a high frequency filter is a good way of, of determining things that are coming from inside that switch gear as well. Uh, but yes, in, in principle, that can be done. And then I've got another question here. The Contact Pro um, detecting PD in SF6 switch gear and also silicon filled power transformer. So for the SF6, SF6 switch gear, we, um, whenever we come to a ring main unit where it's an SF6 tank, we always put the Contact probe on the outside of that tank. So I've tested probably hundreds of them, but I've only ever found one defect inside an SF6 tank. But due to that, the client replaced that switch because it was critical and they didn't want it on that network. And it had had a failure in the past and then it had been rebuilt. Um, Did you find that time? But there wasn't, uh, okay. there, there was no turf that come with it. It was just ticking on the inside of the SF6 tank. Okay, it, it is relatively unusual because you got the higher breakdown strength of SF6 to get the surface tracking happening inside SF6. Yeah. So unlike air, where of course you've got a three kV per millimeter, the the breakdown strength of SF6 is, uh, come on, Brad, twenty. Uh, yep, twenty. Um. <laughs> uh, so you're going to get the, the the probability of having surface tracking inside an SF6 chamber is usually um, much less. You can get some some corona type discharge at times where um, your corona inside the, the, the an SF6 chamber could could cause a to a certain extent the degradation of the insulation. Um, sharp, so sharp points could could cause you thing. But again, it's a much lower, um, a much higher breakdown strength for the SF6, so it's a much less chance of happening. And I guess floating floating particles could be a, a situation inside of that. But the so the the probability of finding surface type related issues on SF6 is much, much less than on air insulated switch gears. So it's not as important um, in our opinion on that. Solid insulation is, is a much more common defect. Okay. Um, what are the lowest voltages that you find PD useful? It's the last question. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good one, isn't it? We, we had um, one earlier where it was um, David Moller from Nelson's asked about low voltage testing, low voltage boards, and okay. yeah, the the ultrasonic sensor can hear sparks. So if you've got sparks jumping a gap, the ultrasonic sensor can hear it. And if the if they're high enough energy sparks, you'll find they can give off TEV signals. And there's a case study from one of our guys over in the Middle East where there was a, a mm -hmm. poor connection on a low voltage board that was roaring away. Um, but PD by, by, sort of by yeah. definition. PD by definition isn't really going to happen at, at low voltage. So you haven't got enough stress to, to break down, even if you went in 
in, um, uh, in very different altitudes. So we, we've even done some testing in the past of uh, uh, when, when you were looking at um, a 680 um, volt system that was going to be used on an airplane and, and is that is that going to cause PD because of altitude? And the answer the answer in that particular case was again no. The we 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 have seen issues very infrequently, but we have seen issues on 3.3 kV or in America on the 4.185, so 4 kV switch gear. It's relatively infrequent. We typically don't test much down around that voltage, 6.6 .6 and above. Yes, we do. Uh, so really, the the cost benefit I would suggest is 6.6 .6 and above, 6.6, 7.2 rated switch gear. Often you used to find that the 3.3 is just rated for 7.2 uh, and running at a lower voltage anyway. So you've even you've got more, you've got less stress and you've got a very good insulation. Uh, sometimes you will also get 6.6 .6 switch KV switch gear on the older one, which is rated at 11, and the same thing will will take consideration there. But we do we do find problems on 6.6. .6. We found we've got some case studies on 6.6 .6, uh, KV cable termination uh, cable joints blowing up uh, recently. Um, so 6.6 .6 is really the bottom end where I think you start getting a cost benefit analysis from doing. And one last question, because we've, we've just gone six minutes over time. Um, we've got, what would cause high ultrasonic and TEV to be there one day and then completely disappear the next day? Usually humidity and movement, usually. Yeah, there you go. Brian, yeah. Brian's answer that. Humidity and movement. Do yeah. you want to answer it more? Brian? Yeah, so humid, humidity will, if you've got uh, surface PD, corona PD, or some sort of gap that's out in the open air, humidity will have a big part in how much the what the amplitude is and how much energy are in the sparks that are jumping that gap so if your humidity drops um chances are that the uh the amplitude will will drop as well or it can completely go away itself uh so and then sometimes loading and movement can play a part in it so if you've got loading and things that are um physically moving because they're contracting expanding that can open up and close up uh air gaps and and clearances between issues so it's usually the movement of your assets and the humidity that plays the biggest part in that occurring. So in just add again, in those sorts of situations is one of the few times that we see load related PD occurring um, where things are moving. It's, it's more the fact that the load is, is moving things away or heating things up. Uh, and, and with the humidity, it's humidity slash dew point. It's, the dew point is the is a, is a bigger thing in terms of the actual moisture in the atmosphere as well. Uh, so what you'll find is anyone who's in a temperate climate uh, where you've got the spring and the autumn and you've got the big cycling. So Brisbane at the, this time of year or is just, just going through where you get quite cool uh, nights and, and the warmer in, in, the, in the daytime. When you get that cycling, you get the, the going through the dew point and you find um, that's the sort of time where, where discharge comes and goes. So sometimes it's um, the time the time that you take in the test can be very important. Uh, I remember a few years ago, we were doing some work in the desert in, in Oman, and in order to find the discharge, it was the early morning before the sun rose and, and sort of the moisture uh, came out of the atmosphere. So if you wanted to do your testing, you did all the early morning testing, um, which is always fun. I think we'll wrap it up there. Okay. Yep. Anybody has any further questions um, or any specifics or you want to go through things, uh, then our contact details are here. We are happy to discuss and, and, and talk to people on this. Um, uh, you know, one, one of our aims is to, to, to share knowledge and show the value. So please get in touch and we'll be happy to answer anything further that you have. Any more, Brad? All good? No, nah, that's it. We've got to everyone's questions. Thanks for being active in the in the questions box. That always makes for good discussion.